Just Branding. Just Branding. Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Just Branding. Today, we're going to be talking about verbal identity in branding. And we have two amazing people, amazing, creative, and talented people with us. We have Margaret Kerr Jarrett and we have Amuna Weiner. They're both creative directors and co founders of the Israeli based agency Ni Hello. And they have been featured recently in Creative Boom, the One Show shortlist. And it's nice that, and many, many other things. Ladies, welcome to the show. We're excited to be having this conversation with you. Thank you so much for having us. So um, we're going to be talking about verbal identity and branding. But just before we get to that, I think it would be really helpful to kind of get a bit of a picture of, of you both, of your agency and how you have basically got to where you've got to in your careers. So Margaret, I don't know if you want to go first. Sure. So um, my background originally was academic. I was very interested in poetry and creative writing throughout my life. And it's a huge passion of mine. But I also really enjoy business. Um, I found the academic world to be a bit stifling. And after many different types of roles over the years in marketing, copywriting, eventually I really landed in the design world where I found a greater appreciation for craft and just more of a strategic focus as opposed to a lot of the marketing type copywriting that um, people are so familiar with, which is more sales and conversion oriented. And I really saw a place where I could carve out a niche for myself in terms of bringing that sort of element of strategic and design thinking, but from a very strong verbal perspective and not just in terms of what message are we communicating, but really what are the words that we use and how can we use language to its utmost abilities to help serve the greater purposes of the brands that we build. Um, in terms of our agency, Amuna and I actually worked together at a different agency that's no longer around several years ago. And we quickly saw that there was a lot of synergy in the way that we thought about brand and thought about general communications. Um, we were both working independently for many years after that. And we had a similar pain point where, you know, I would be hired by an agency or a brand to come in and build out a voice, a tone, specific copy elements and verbal identity elements. But then I would see the design was often disjointed from the language and it was really treated as a piecemeal process. Um, and I really thought that, you know, there must be a way to really combine the, the power of design and writing together and create more of a synergistic relationship. And um, that's really why we founded Nilo to kind of fit that, fill that need and to bring the, the best of writing and the best of design together to do something like even better than they could do by themselves. Nice, amazing. Amuna, do you want to add anything to that? You, you know, give us a bit of a flavor from your background. Sure. Um, so I come from a slightly less surprising, more traditional design background. Um, I actually started off my career in production design. So building prototyping kind of storefront displays for various retail environments. Um, and then along the way, you know, I moved more towards graphic design, worked at a few agencies, um, worked with Margie, and then quickly kind of realized that branding is the area I want to focus on. There's been a lot of conversation about why people go into branding, but I will just say one thing, which is what when I saw Margie's work, which is even her traditional work, her traditional poetry work, I realized that there's such an opportunity that's just lacking in the design world. Um, and we really want to kind of embrace that idea of opportunity. Every medium is a new opportunity. We talk about visual and verbal, but there's sound, there's motion. And so that's really kind of what we're trying to embrace in our in our work together. Okay, great. Well thanks thanks for that. I think that's super interesting. And and uh did you call did you call Margaret Margie? Is that oh is that... I did call Margaret Margie. I did. Yeah, yeah. you're right. welcome so, to call me Margie are, too. Are that's... we allowed to call you Margie? That's that's you can totally call me Margie. That's what that's fantastic. what everyone calls me. Fantastic. I won't tell you what we should call Jacob, but that, that'll be for another conversation. <laughs> um, so Margie, you know, interesting your background, um, you know, in the more academic kind of poetic kind of uh, linguistic kind of area, uh, particularly for this podcast. So I'm, I'm excited to kind of see where, where this goes. I guess um, one of the questions that we tend to ask guests, and I think this is helpful, is do you have a kind of a def definition of, of brand and branding that you that you use? And, and what, what would that be? And then let's kind of focus in on, on what 
what verbal identity is, which we've mentioned and define that please. So rather than maybe like define branding, I think maybe I could talk a bit to our approach, which is very much focused on concept. The way we um, create a brand is by taking all of our strategic frameworks and you know, a very in-depth understanding of the company and the customers and all the different parties involved and trying to distill that into a concept that can communicate directly with the customer in a way that is um, like really meeting them face to face, using their language, using their emotions. And we really like to keep that concept singular in most cases and figure out all the different ways we can communicate that concept across touch points and through different mediums. That's awesome. Really interesting to hear you talk about um, kind of building a brand from a, a, a concept. And just before we kind of proceed, it would be great to kind of get a bit of a, a, a real live example, if you like, of what that means. So have you got any examples that you could sort of share with us that, that kind of help our listeners and ourselves kind of get, 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 get the picture of what we're talking about here when we're talking about a core concept? Yes. Um, there is a brand that we're currently working on, which is a tequila brand. Um, and the name of the tequila. I like it Pop. already. I like yeah, it Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the name of the brand is called Casa Malka. Um, Casa obviously traditionally means house and Malka in Hebrew means queen. And, and Malka also happens to be the name of, um, the founder's wife. So it, it already had this very strong origin story when we were going into it. But, you know, once we understood that, and once we understood kind of the story that we could be leading with, we jumped right into it. And the entire brand became revolved around this very core concept of the queendom and kind of this idea of like, welcome to the house of the queen and connecting feminine energy with, um, you know, the very rustic based nature of, an agave plant and tequila growing and, and that that balance of very, very real earth-based growth and that very strong feminine energy. And when we started building out both visual and verbal and really all the touch points, it all came back to this very royal regal idea of, of welcome to the queendom. You'd see that visually in what the bottle looks like. The bottle is um, kind of visually represents you know, like a, a Greek goddess almost with a very clear white label and then a gold um, like emblem on top. You see that with all the verbal and all the tone of voice and all the kind of different touch points and the assets that we created. Um, there's some beautiful, beautiful poetry work from Marky in there. And we worked with various different artists. We worked with a CG artist to create the renders of the bottle and everything, you know, the, the checks and balances of building out this brand always comes back to, are we embracing this idea of welcome to the queendom or are we getting lost in some other trend or concept or um, tangent and that becomes our our guiding principle okay so you have the concept and then you move into the story but how do you you kind of jump to you know the the bottle design and all that good stuff but how do you actually get to that point is it the design first is it the copy first I don't want to cause any fights here, but I'd love to know your process. Cause some fights, Jacob. Cause some fights. No man. fights. No <laughs> fights. Um, <laughs> it's a really good question. And like, to be honest, it's not something that we have. It's not like such a clear um, process in that it always goes this way or that. In general, we do create like a very core strategic framework. We go through a pretty in-depth brand strategy process for most of our clients. And then we try to distill it down to the concept. The concept is neither visual nor verbal, it's conceptual. So it's like, I, it's an idea. And then we really figure out how to build that concept out. So sometimes um, the language comes first and the design follows that. And sometimes the design comes first. Sometimes the product design needs to come first. In the case of Casamalca, because it is a physical product, we really had to design the bottle before we could build out the rest of the brand touch points in order to really understand how to create that consistency and how to make sure everything's a reflection um, of the concept. So it's not, you know, there's no formula that we follow other than making sure that we are really aligned on what that concept is so that everything we create ties back into that. And and I assume you get buy-in from the client, do you, on the concept? Make sure you pitch that concept. Yes, make sure they're absolutely. Comfortable with it, and then from yeah. there you build out... 
the, the verbal and visual. So you dodged a quick question, Margaret, earlier. What is this verbal you talk about? How do you define verbal identity? So verbal identity, I think you can really just think of how you would define visual identity and think of how you can apply that to language. So verbal identity is really all the places where someone might interact with a brand that is verbal, that contains language, or maybe that even could contain language, but no one thought to do it before. Um, what language you use and how you choose to present it, that's the verbal identity. So dive deeper on this concept. <laughs> so you have the queendom, right? You haven't got the bottle design, but you have part of the backstory. So how did you get to kind of the bottle design and when, when did you bring in this like verbal identity and how did you, uh, I guess, weave that through the identity? You know, what are some examples of that? Sure. So with Casa Malka, like we really try to bring visual and verbal in, um, in different, you know, in different ways. Some brands require more of a visual focus and we embrace that. And some brands require actually to lead with a more verbal focus and we embrace that as well. So each brand is different. Um, with a brand like Casa Malka, we want to really take advantage of all the possibilities. So we want to, you know, every single place the customer is going to be interfacing with, we want to think about how can we interface with them in different ways that will sort of like touch them differently? So they'll see the bottle, they'll get like visual cues. They'll also read the text, which will give them other cues. Um, they'll see, you know, imagery. They'll see the typography, every single cue that's being given to the customer. We want to make sure that's all tied to that core concept. So with Casabalca, the, the label, the way that we write the copy on the label, what we put on the label, um, what we put, you know, on the packaging, what we put on different brand materials, like what we're creating for this tequila brand. We're doing a few things for them, like a, um, like a recipe card to include in their packaging. We're creating uh, out of home campaigns that will include elements of the storytelling, visual, visually and verbally. And um, depending on what the product or what the client is, it could just be, you know, it could be almost anything depending on what's okay. needed. Well, I'd love to go one layer deeper. You know, you've done the high level, but for this example of the tequila brand, you know, it's like the feminine energy and the queendom. So what sort of language are you using, both visual and verbal, to actually communicate that feminine energy that you spoke of? Sure. So I'll speak from the verbal and maybe Emily could speak from the visual. Um, for me, it's really important to think about how, you know, what's the tone and how can we match the language style to the tone of this brand? So if you get a chance to read some of the language and the verbal branding for Casamaka, you'll see the tone is very inviting. It's very almost enticing, maybe even like a little bit seductive. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of emphasis of very visceral imagery. So, you know, seeing the, the sky open up or feeling the, the dry earth and really um, getting in touch with like the visceral experience because drinking any alcohol but tequila, it's very much like a sensory experience. So the language really reflects that. And um, it reflects this idea of being invited into something. You know, we're inviting you into this experience of the tequila. And, you know, we're calling that the queendom from the, the point of view of our concept. But the language is very inviting, very enticing, very visceral. Um, really, we, we strive that every single word and every aspect of the brand will have that same tone, visually and verbally. That's awesome. Um, I love to go even, even deeper on this. So maybe we'll talk about the, the visual aspect. So you talked about sensory. Is it a premium product? It sounds like it is if you're talking about these things. So, yes. um, so yeah. it's a premium brand. It's all about the experience. You're talking about this like queendom. Um, I guess that's the place you go. I'm assuming that's what you're using with the visuals. Correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what it sounds like. So how do you create this queendom world if that's what um, you are doing? I'll talk about that a bit from uh, a visual experience, you know, starting from the very kind of core traditional identity elements, which are the typography, the color palette, um, logo, et cetera. Um, the entire thing was built on this balance of brutalistic kind of like relationship to earth and again, that feminine energy. So in the typography, you'll see we're using two 
you know, very different but complementary fonts. One of them for the actual logo is this very kind of brutalist font, which you wouldn't expect for a typical typical kind of like feminine product. Um, and the other one is a much more kind of delicate paired back font. And that balance is somewhat shocking and surprising. Um, another piece of the visual identity we have is an actual illustration of, of the queen, which is drawn in this very kind of, um, you know, ink bleedy sort of um, messy kind of way that almost looks like an old antique stamp. And we have this queen and we have her very like, kind of like sensual energy just sitting on a rock and she becomes a core part of the brand that we use delicately but significantly and then when it comes to the actual bottle design um I, I can talk about I mean I'm looking at it in front of me but I can talk about the actual bottle design it's this very very kind of clear stark premium bottle um which is primarily just the clear glass on the very bottom almost shockingly small is um just a black and white label and then on top you have this beautiful like gold sticker um with the queen's emblem on top and the way we're building out the visual assets of the brand beyond the product is a big part of the core concept we, we have this idea from the get-go when we were building this out but is to have a cg artist actually place this tequila bottle inside a very raw rustic desert um filled with like natural elements and then have all of this sort of like gold jewels and antique um almost like pirate booty, like dripping all around it and constantly just telling this very interesting, tantalizing, seductive story of here is this premium, beautiful, feminine thing against the backdrop of a very rustic, a very um, natural environment. So every single, and that, and that goes even deeper into when we're playing with typography, there's a lot of like um, full, with margin to margin typography bleeding all the way into the edges and it almost looks like a mistake and it almost looks like you know it, it doesn't look neat enough and that and we're embracing that because it's it's raw and it's um like kind of shocking and surprising and so just every iteration every kind of detail that we can think of to play on this story obviously we're not always thinking about it like that it kind of comes naturally but um yeah, it, it, we want people to be questioning our work and being like, oh, like, why did it, why, why is it like that? That's not something we would expect to see and constantly kind of question themselves and invite them into thinking more about the work that we're doing. You said you had it there. So if people watching the videos, can you show us on the, the video? Uh, oh, uh, not yet. Not yet. Uh, oh. not yet. Not yet. <laughs> there were so many um, good words in there. They're just like, oh, they just. Oh, really no, I know. I want to see it. I want to see it. But you I know, mean, should I should I show one? Uh oh, yes, uh -oh. we should. Show us. Should, Come on. We now. should show one. Okay, we'll show one. Hold on one second. This is the brand. Um, this is the bottle design. It's still in progress on its own. Um, the queen you can't see so well in these renders, but is up top there. And we have a few different kind of versions of what this setting looks like. Sorry, but um this becomes kind of, in terms of out of home advertising, the story, the tone of the brand. Um, this is some really beautiful poetry about, about the queendom and welcoming like you into the queendom world. Um, and you can see here what I'm talking about, about it going edge to edge and this motif again, welcome to the queendom. And can we, can we hear some of the poetry? Yeah, I'm gonna read it. Hold on a second. Mario, should I read your poetry? Yeah. Okay, hold on. This is really exciting stuff. I really love seeing this true example. I've got tons more questions, but let's hear let's hear sure. the how the verbal has come out. So this 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 text is written on the backside of the label of the bottle. Um, here it goes. Bones hewn from stalks, skin stitched from petals, breath captured from the edges of the wind, eyes molded from drops of dew. The queen sprouts forth from the ground, lifts her hands to your hands leads you inside her palace and fills your glass. Welcome to the queendom. And then it goes on to talk about Casa Malco Blanco, 100% agave as well, et cetera, et cetera. But um, Boom. just, yeah. That's Beautiful. so exciting. That's so good. Um, so tons of questions, tons of questions now. Right, get ready. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the original concept and, um, you know, as a lot of people know, I'm a massive kind of fan of strategic thinking. So you think strategically first, you call it the concept. And then you translate that out into assets that communicate the meaning 
you know effectively as you've as you've demonstrated so just just interested in how you worked I mean you mentioned the name so it had a kind of an, an origin story but how did you how did you kind of get the buy-in from the client how did you kind of connect all of the dots um, and, and what does your sort of strategy uh, deck look like you know what kind of things do you put in it to get to this point yeah I think um our strategy process is it's pretty similar um for each client though you know obviously we have to tailor things in terms of which strategic elements get put into our strategy deck you know that really depends um we find that more sort of like high-tech companies or companies that are more of a service as opposed to a product need a lot more of the positioning type messaging and um you know, very broad competitive analysis, benchmark brands, probably, you know, a lot of the same kind of stuff that you guys do. We certainly go through that process in a lot of depth. Um, something that's particularly important for us is especially as it relates to verbal identity is really understanding the voice of the customer. So like, I'll give you another example, a brand we recently did, which was very different from Casamalca. It was a um, in-home dialysis company. So it's kind of disrupting the dialysis healthcare marketplace, which is typically done in centers. Um, you know, people have to get up and drive to these centers. And this company has a really actually exciting model, bringing dialysis into people's homes on their own schedules. So we actually, in addition to talking a lot to a lot of patients, we did a ton of deep diving on like Reddit and Quora to just really hear the words and stories of the people who are undergoing this like really awful experience of having kidney failure and having to have dialysis and getting into like their mind and really trying to understand their perspective is a huge part of our strategic process. And it's really what allows us to build out our concept in a way that's going to speak to what the customers, um, you know, need or want or feel. But actually, we didn't really talk about the customer for the um, tequila brand. Who, who was the court audience for that? So it's 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 kind of like an interesting there's really two types of brands we work on um i mean there's many but we see the process for creating a brand new brand from scratch is very different from maybe like a rebrand or a sub brand which there's already a lot of understanding of who the customers are and how they're working so for a tequila brand um it's sort of a very growing industry. I mean, it used to be tequila was like the party drink and you know, you stand on the bar and you take a shot and you're not really savoring the flavor of the tequila. So tequila in recent years has become much more, um, there's more of like a luxury tequila market where people are interested in savoring the flavors and understanding the different, uh, you know, wood fermenting and all the different kind of ways you can experience like a finer spirit. So it is more of a luxury product is the goal, which, it will be targeted more towards people who have an interest in saving, savoring the actual beverage as opposed to just like taking shots and having fun. Um, and that's, that's really an emerging market. So we do have some information about those customers, but not a ton. Okay. I want to dive into the concept of verbal identity a little bit more and, and sort of explode that if, if we can. So you showed us some examples there. We've talked about sort of strategic thinking and the concepts and how that translates down. But here's a question. What is the difference, right, between verbal identity writing, right, and uh, perhaps just normal copywriting on a website or for a brochure? You know, how do you sort of see that in terms of how you look at things? We get this question a lot. Um, and we realize something that people are a concept that people are already familiar with, which is really relevant and parallel to verbal identity versus copywriting is this idea of like, your brand is more than a logo, which we see everywhere. And on the one hand, a client could go and outsource um, somebody making a logo and outsource some graphic design collateral, or you can approach people to inherently build your brand, understand your brand, and then express it through whatever mediums you're expressing it to. So we see a direct parallel to that, to verbal identity versus copywriting. Copywriting is a verbal asset, but it's not actually creating the core foundational verbal brand um, and how we express it and creating the constraints and restraints around that. 
So, so can I just ask a quick question? So you're talking like principles. So you're, 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 you're writing at a high level, you're, you're setting the tone, you're getting it. So how do you kind of define those principles? So like, say, for example, the, uh, the, the tequila brand we were talking about, you, you mentioned the idea of being welcoming, the central experience. Do you document those as sort of principles or pillars or anything like that? How does that sort of look? Um, that's a good question. We do in the strategic phase, we do focus a lot on like brand personality and brand tone. And that's where we begin to build that up. But I will admit that a lot of sort of the magic that happens is really once you begin the creative process and we do like to leave space for that to emerge. I think another point to your previous question that's really important as you know, verbal identity is very much tied together with visual identity. So if it's like I said before, piecemealed where you have a visual designer and then someone comes in to fill in with some words, you know, you're not you're not really allowing the verbal and the visual to lean on each other. Sometimes you don't have to go so far with the visual if you have verbal to lean on and vice versa and it can create a little more tension and nuance in the brand when you have both of those mediums working together. Yeah, so do you do you use any for um tools like archetypes to you know form that the personality it sounds very like the lover archetype very seductive and sensory and you know it, that sounds like what it, it is and then you com com contrast it with the harsher visuals of the desert and those you know spiky plants and the cacti cacti of cactus um it kind of like just <laughs> works really well together so is that do you use tools like that you know, I've tried to use archetypes in the past. It's never worked for me very much. I think maybe you're right that intuitively we do develop an archetype for our brand, but it's not something we really define. Um, we have sort of other ways of defining things that just work better for us. So, so what are some of those other ways? Like I mentioned with the personality and the tone, I think, you know, mood boarding is something that's very important for us to do. And we always prefer to do like multiple concepts so that we can really hone in on what that tone is in a very specific way. And, you know, those are the processes that help us really land on that very specific personality. We've got so many questions. <laughs> All right, so tone. So can we break down tone? Like how do you actually de decide the tone when it comes to visual or, you know, verbal? I mean, I think it all ties back to strategy. So once again, really understanding the company, the product, the product strategy, the way that the customer is going to interface with the brand is really important. Like with Cosmalka, it's a very physical experience, but with many brands, you know, it's behind a screen. So all of those really play into understanding how we can best communicate or try and communicate with the customer. Um, for a brand that's more, you know, let's say like a, a service or a, a, pro, a software product. So you're going to have to really speak to their immediate needs. So the focus is going to be much more on like a value proposition for them. And the tone is going to be probably, you know, more helpful, lighthearted, um, focused, as opposed to Casamalca, which the tone is, I'd say a little more, it's, it's like more sensory and more intimate you know, it'd be a little bit inappropriate to bring such an intimate tone to like a B2B software company. So just really having a, a very in-depth understanding of the company, the, the consumer landscape, the customers, and really understanding what's the most appropriate in that context. I like, I like you tie it all back to strategy because I hope, you know, what folks are hearing here is, is that to do amazing creative work, you still need to have the strategy set, right? You still need to have that to go back to, to build from, um, which I, I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan of, as everybody knows. Um, question though, right? So we've talked about setting the tone. We've so talked about setting the principles, finding the concept, you know, and linking all that through from the strategy. But how would uh, a company embed these principles on an ongoing basis? Because one thing I find, and I don't know if you, you will see this in your work, is that there's an initial focus on this type of stuff um, and everybody gets excited and it's brilliant and wonderful. And then three years down the line, you know, things have kind of, if, if people don't keep check on it, things can kind of drift away and suddenly the, the brand loses its soul, you know, and then you have to do the whole process all over again. So I wondered if you had any thoughts on, you know, all the great work that you do, how do you see that being embedded and continuing uh, on into businesses as time goes on? Sure. 
Um, that's a very important question. A big pain point for us and part of the reason we started the agency is because we found that over and over again, we'd be doing our kind of siloed work, handing it over to our clients and they'd either take it and work with other um, contractors or take it in house. And then it's really nice. And the work appears on our website on a case study, but it doesn't actually exist in real life. And it doesn't actually interact with the customers the way we intended it to. And that's extremely disappointing whenever that happens. So there's a few different ways we address that. One is from the get-go, we're very eager to make a brand that not only, you know, tells a beautiful story um, and is emotionally resonant, but is very, very practical for the clients to use. To that end, you know, things will change based on what the client capabilities are. You know, one client is a nonprofit that has 300 different um, departments and they are going to need a system that tons and tons of people can access and dish out. Another client has their core creative in-house team um, and that's it and we'll work directly with them. But take again, that's also part of the way we view strategy from the get-go is what are the restraints we're working in, this, is, this being one of them, and how do we make sure to actually build something out that's practical and sustainable that also comes down to making things like very clear voice and tone guidelines and you know brand guidelines and stuff like that. But to that end, we also, um, very practically speaking, we also encourage our clients to continue with us on a retainer basis, not necessarily that we're doing the work, but just so that we can serve as an outside you know, consult to be guardians of the brand and to kind of maintain that checks and balances. It's not like, you know, you don't work with an accountant once and then just drop them um, you, you have to maintain it and it's a constant effort. And we also have to be prepared that the needs of a company might change and it might evolve and we need to prepare our brands from the get-go to evolve with them and to change with them and see how we can adapt the brand and maybe change the brand um, in order for it to work. Because if it doesn't work, it's it's frankly irrelevant. That's that's really that's really a great answer. I love that approach of being super flexible depending on the client needs. And as you say, the company might change, but over time the customer might change, right? And, exactly. and so, so the, the brand has to constantly be checking its core principles and its core concept against the needs and wants and desires of its customers, which may need to be evolved uh, over, over time. I, I absolutely love that. Um, one one thing I, I wondered um, about your, your retainers, if you don't mind me asking, I'm, I'm obsessed about retainers because what <laughs> I find is, is that a lot of creative people, they, they do, they hop from project to project to project, which is the way that their brains tend to work. But the issue that with that is that you're constantly feast or famine kind of from a business perspective. It's quite a, uh, a precarious position to yeah, be in yes. from a business side. So, 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 you know, building out retainers has surely got to be a, a smart business approach. So what do you include in your retainers to ensure that you are helping uh, clients on an ongoing basis just out of interest? Yeah. So, I mean, to a certain extent, it would be, ongoing kind of asset creation, there's a limit to that. Like we're not gonna be creating their social posts for them, but if they have a specific campaign or they have a white paper or they have some new pages of the website that need to be written, um, we'll, we'll, so there's there's kind of this uh, like by, body of work that we will do with them to just continue to expand the brand. And then a lot of it is also consultation work. Um, a lot of the clients that we work with have some of their in-house teams and have in-house capabilities, but those um, employees need some sort of brand training. Uh, so we will work with them and say, this works, this doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Um, if some of the language needs to be adjusted, like you said, based on new client, based on customers changing, we'll work with them and make sure it's still, again, uh, against the original strategy and it still works within it and it's still on brand. So there's some actual asset creation, there's some actual work being done, and then a lot of it is also consultation. Here's, a, here's something to think about, just to, just to throw out there. Like I've, I've found with some of my clients, like training is an interesting thing that we don't yeah, explore yeah. often, particularly as you mentioned, like in massive companies where lots of people are gonna be t creating assets and touch points. And I found that that's quite an interesting thing to, to offer, to extend a, uh, a contract, if you like, is to say, well, hey, you know, we've done this great work. Everybody's super happy. 
what if um, we run four training sessions over the next year, right? Where yeah. you, anyone can show up and we're going to re reconnect everybody with the principles of the brand and, and that kind of stuff. You ever thought about doing that? Is that something that would ever, ever, ever inter interest you? Yeah, I think so. I think so as long as there are practical ramifications of it. I find that sometimes those kind of large company-wide sessions are just like talking and like waxing poetic about the brand and the brand philosophy and, you know, make sure to remain friendly in your tone of voice and make sure that, and, and for that, it's like, well, that was a nice hour session, but it doesn't really mean yeah. anything. So I would, abs we, I would absolutely love to do more training sessions as long as there's really being um, clear guidelines as to what the training session is about. And we, we really, some creatives like to kind of just do their creative thing and bounce. We feel very frustrated when the brands we create don't live and breathe um, to their full potential. So we will do everything we can to help the client maintain it. Right. That, that, I think that is the major challenge, right, of, 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 yeah. of creative work is like, and we get so infuriated, don't we, when we don't see it lived. Um, and so that's something that I've been focusing on in my consultancy work for more from a business consultancy perspective. Like, how do we get this great stuff into a company? Mm -hmm. Training's training's one. And one one session that I, I, I've been doing sessions with sales teams, right? Mm -hmm. So 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 you reconnect them with the brand and go through the strategy, show them how it how it looks and feels. And then one thing that, you know, talk about practical, one thing I love to do is get them off in pairs um, to then come back and do a, a pitch of the brand, right? Ooh. Just the brand, not the, not the product. Um, sell me the brand, the essence of the brand, why it exists, the story, the narrative. And, and I found that so interesting. And do it in front of your peers and then everybody discuss it afterwards, right? So everybody that's takes great. their own take on it. And, yeah. and then you can kind of find things you're like, hang on, that's really not, really in keeping with what we what we what we're trying to do here uh, so you have to handle it carefully but yeah it's a it's a cool it's a cool kind of uh, approach yeah. but anyway en enough about enough about me let's just uh, kind of start ra wrapping things up um going back to the to the verbal identity and the principles um I, the one for margie really have you ever been in a situation where you've got this great brand and and um you know you've done the principles and you hand it over and then you see you see it not be followed and and what do you do then like do, do you know how do you advise companies to make sure that that because you talk for example you talked about the, the 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 tequila brand you talked about being inviting you talked about the queendom you've talked about all that stuff do you actually literally tangibly build out principles that say do not say this we say this you know and 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 go through and then how do you as i say so first of all do you actually build that out? And secondly, how do you approach it when you see that not happening? Yeah, so voice tone guidelines are a very popular thing to talk about in the copywriting world. In my experience, um, people don't know how to follow them very well because it's sort of theoretical, you know, speak this way, not this way. It's like, how does someone just change the way they speak? It's a difficult way to try to, you know, get someone on board. So I will create like a basic framework for voice and tone just to really set the stage. But what we actually are really focused on doing is creating like a toolkit. So we call it like a visual and verbal toolkit. And in the process of branding, we'll create a lot of different pieces of visual and verbal collateral that can be used together separately for all kinds of different purposes. And um, that really serves. And then like our hope is that the client will build upon that and will consult with us to continue to build upon that and that will give them kind of some of the core language elements that they can use. So you could, if you need to do a social media post, you can pull things from the verbal toolkit to help kind of frame that post in context for the brand. Um, we also create, you know, we, we love doing campaigns. So we'll create a lot of different examples of the type of language and the type of visuals you can use in a campaign and really how they work together. Because I think that's something that brands struggle with is, you know, you have some design assets and you have some copywriting and do you just, you know, throw it up there together? How do they work together? And that's something, you know, when we do hand a brand over to a client, we, we go into that in a lot of depth. How do you really use all these assets on their own together in what instances? And we find that that is like a lot more useful than the voice tone guidelines, which are really just kind of, it's more of a strategic thing, um, almost like to use internally. Yeah. Nice. Right, Jacob, any final questions before we, uh, we, we, uh, we, we finish? 
So you mentioned voice and tone, which is, you know, encapsulates everything about voice and tone, but do you go into detail such as uh, like vocabulary, for example, words to use or like that they can plug and play or like sentences? Is that kind of what you're referring yeah. to? Yeah. So I, I love creating like a lexicon, which would be like just a big group of words that would be relevant for this brand. Um, you know, like we said, for the Casa Malka brand, what type of language are we using? So if we're going very image-based and visceral versus very conceptual and idea-based, um, we will definitely, you know, find ways to communicate that, that work for the client. And just like Amuna said, it depends on their capabilities. So if someone has like amazing writer in house, who's really capable of taking this stuff and building upon it, then we're going to build the brand in one way. If they really just need plug and play, we're going to build it in a different way. Um, so it really depends on what the client needs. We really don't have any type of, you know, pre-created formulas or packages. Everything is like super custom. I like that, right? Because I think some people can get themselves into a situation where they say, no, this is our process and this is what we do. And yeah. they box themselves in. And if that does, isn't appropriate for the client, it's, they become very rigid. And I always find that every client's different, like you've outlined, like yeah. every customer group's different, every business is different, all the leadership teams are different, they're set up, they're, they're people, everything's unique. And so to, to kind, kind of try and crowbar that into a very rigid process, you need a process, right? But if it's too rigid, it becomes very, uh, you, know, it, you know, perhaps areas become irrelevant and, and then that's where frustrations occur. Yeah. So uh, smart stuff. Well, it comes back to the strategy, right? Where, yeah. Where what, what are the, the values of the brand and how, do, how does the tone and the voice actually relate back to that strategy and, you know, the values? So for example, I, used, I recently did a lover type of, type archetype brand for an eyewear company. You love the lover, don't you, Drake? I love it. Just a lover. <laughs> so the, a lot of the words were very, very seductive and sensory, kind of like you were mentioning. So we use that, those words uh, as like a guide to you know, create a lexicon for them. So their brand was very handcrafted. It was very like sustainable. And it was very um, sensory as well. So we had words that were related around those values, which were very tied to the strategy as well. So even if they just picked up a few words here or there for like a social media capture, and we showed right, they had that to come back to. It related to the strategy, it related to the values and the brand's personality. So it made it very easy for them to you know, pick up words here and there, even though they're not a particular uh, a copywriter. So Yeah. 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 So helpful to just have those constraints. You need them. Um, even as creatives, it's so easy to go crazy and do anything. And you need those constraints in order to point you in the right direction. Well, we've definitely come full circle. You know, it's about the strategy. <laughs> it's always about yes. the strategy. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. We loved your example with the, the tequila brand and how you showed us the, the, the how the strategy informs the, the concept and the storytelling and how you weave, you know, copywriting and verbal identity all together to create a, a really strong product. And I really encourage people to listen in to check out the, the tequila bottle uh, and the graphics because you'll get to see it all come together. And, you know, it's really, really beautiful. It's really uh, a very nice contrast between, you know, simple and, you know, earthy and feminine. It's like, it's a really, really strong job. So well done girls. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, brilliant. And, and Jacob and I, expect a bottle of that to arrive at Absolutely. both of our studios um you know we're, we're Absolutely. In, uh, just to, you know anyway no look um thank you so much for covering up the time final final question for me where do people find you both um how do they connect with you and and, and follow your work sure so um, our website <laughs> is question. our website's vlo.agency and maybe you can put that in the show notes cuz how do you spell it how do you spell it mom n n i h i l o we actually on our website have a whole article about our name, which comes from the Latin ex nihilo, which means something from nothing. Um, so you can go to our website and, you know, we're on LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, you can find all those links on our website and personally just type in our names and you'll find us, Margaret Kerjeran and Amun Weiner. Brilliant. We have well, a thanks. newsletter. Sign up for our newsletter. Oh, yeah, sign up sign for up our for newsletter. newsletter. Yeah. All right. 
We'll drop, we'll drop that in the show notes. Listen, thanks so much, both of you, for carving out this time. We appreciate it. And it's been great to kind of go toe-to-toe with you and, and dig into to all these things. I particularly, personally, love the fact that, you know, we, we've, we've linked the verbal with the visual and then back to the strategy. So from me and Mr. Lover Lover, thank you so much. Take care. And uh, we'll see <laughs> you next time on Just Branding. Just Branding. Thank you.